Yeah, thank you guys for coming. I think it'd be really nice if everyone can just put in the chat what year they're in, if they're a dental student or if you're a, a DFT or you're a DCT, just so I have an idea of kind of what year group everyone is. So I can kind of talk about certain things in more detail. Um, but I'm going to start the presentation like every cringe uh, webinar. So I'm going to start about me. Um, so I went uh, to a like a London high school. Um, I went to Preston Manor, um, had lots of fun there, a lot of naughty kids around, but I tried to keep my head down and study and, uh, you know, get my good grades. Um, and after that, I got out of that high school. I went to a bit of a better sixth form. I went to St. Dominic's Sixth Form College. It was like a Catholic college. Um, it was just a sixth form. So like really um, like um, a lot of studying. Everyone was kind of keen there. Um, and that's where I kind of was influenced to kind of either go down medicine or dentistry. Um, and in the end, I decided dentistry and I applied for um, uh, Kings, Queens, Bristol and Cardiff. It was my dream to go to Kings or Queens just so I could stay in London because I'm like, I was like a proper London boy. Um, but I didn't get those offers and I got Bristol and that's where I went for university. Um, I thought I was going to hate it, going living out and things like that. But it actually turned out to be like one of the best five years of my life. I really enjoyed it. I met some really good people, made some really good friends. Um, but at the end of fifth year, I, I was quite sick of like being out and I really wanted to come back home. Um, so I got really homesick and I really wanted to come back to London for my foundation training. So I studied loads for my SJT um, and the interviews, um, did pretty well. And I managed to get Northwest London, which is literally right um, next to my house. And that's where I am now. So uh, on the left, you see the photo of me and Dr. Gore. Um, I'm really, really privileged to have Dr. Gore as my foundation uh, uh, or my foundation trainee. Um, we work oh. together in the practice in Harrow. So I'm there um, three days a week with her. Um, and um, one day a week, we have our study days. And uh, one day a week, we have a community yeah. placement. Um, not every foundation trainee scheme is like that. So not everyone has a, a community day, but all of them will have um, a one day study day. Um, and in my spare time, I run a YouTube channel with uh, my friend Ali, um, it's called Two Dentists. Um, we make loads of dentistry videos and things like that. So in terms of um, DFT, so I wanted to briefly just talk about the application process. I can see, you know, a lot of the people we have in the chat, we have like lots of fourth years, lots of fifth years, um, um, and um, we have some DFTs as well. So I'll try and talk about the whole application process and I'll talk about DFT as well. So of course, all of you have sat your SJTs already. Um, those those in fifth year um, it's really hard to know how well you've done um, a lot of us came out of it you know some of us thought we, we, we did really well some of us thought we did really bad um, and it's really hard to kind of guess how well you've done and you just really don't know so if you think you've done bad really honestly don't be disappointed I have loads of friends who thought they did horrible but then they ranked really highly um, so it's really up and down you can't really guess um, the next thing for you for you guys is um, ranking the schemes. Um, and you can see you have until the 13th of May. Um, it's already opened. I don't know if you guys are already looking into it or not. I would suggest kind of staying away from spending too much time looking at it now. I think it's a bit too early. Um, probably best if you start looking into it like end of April, beginning of May. Um, it doesn't take too long to kind of decide which schemes you want to rank. I would say it probably take you about a week or so. It kind of depends just how much research you want to do and um, how much you're bothered basically. Um, in terms of the ranking, so I think um, the main thing for people is whether they're deciding if they want to stay at home or uh, live out. Um, for me, for me, the decision was quite easy because um, I really wanted to get back home, get back to London. Um, and so um, it was, I was just really main, making sure I was prioritizing all the schemes that allowed me to live at home, which was all the Northwest London, North London, South London and things like that. Um, and my decision was also accompanied by the fact that if you live at home, um, you get to save a lot of money. So if you really think about it, um, if you are able to, for your foundation training, come back home and live at home, you will save anywhere between 10 to 15,000 um, pounds. And that's, that can be a, a lot of money, which you can use to kind of invest in yourself or save for the future. Um, and so my advice would be, if you don't mind living at home, come home, live at home. And um, it is quite helpful to have your um, family kind of help you throughout the year um, you know my mom makes my food um, and you know it's just you know it's, it's a lot easier um, and of course foundation training can be difficult you know you're working nine to five for the first time every single day you're working so being able to come home to a family and have things ready for you is actually quite convenient and I know I sound spoiled but it's the truth like it's really nice um, 
but some of you I know will think about um, you don't you'll definitely want to live out and that's completely fair enough I really enjoyed living out for my five years of uni um, and probably soon I want to live out again as well just because of the freedom aspect is really nice um, some of the things you want to think about is kind of rent so before when you're when you're deciding which schemes you want to rank you can look at the different areas um, check right move check how much the rent will be for the area um, and so you can have a good idea of how, what your expenses will be. Of course, certain areas will be more expensive than others, like London, Bristol, Oxford, they tend to be more expensive. So you kind of want to think about how much money you want to spend. Um, and you want to check your living costs of the city. Again, like I said, um, it'll be quite expensive if you're living in London. Um, travel as well. Certain schemes don't really have good public transport. So like, you know, Somerset or Devon those areas, the practices are quite far out. And so um, most likely the best way for you to get to that practice will probably be with a car. So if you're living out, of course, you're going to have your rent, you're going to have your bills and stuff, but you'll most likely need to get a car as well. So it just adds another expense for you to think about. Um, but of course, if you like the area, then, you know, something you can consider. Um, all these things are basically just you got to ask yourself, what's my priority? So for me, my priority was I wanted to save as much money as I can for my first year. Um, and so living out was the right choice for me. There'll be other priorities. So some of you may have um, a priority for wanting to get as much clinical experience as possible. Um, and so you might want to go to a scheme that has a really high end, um, like high needs area. So lots of patients, you'll be seeing, you'll be taking out teeth every single day, treating lots of caries. Um, those schemes tend to be the ones that are a bit more far out, so like Cornwall or Devon and things like that. Um, whereas in certain areas of London, it'll probably be a bit more low needs so you may not get as much experience as some of the um, other people in the other schemes. Um, I've mentioned the study days as well. Um, so as I mentioned, you have one day study day every single week um, and they tend to be at like a local hospital or somewhere. Um, and again, these study days can sometimes be quite far out as well. So you could uh, potentially just wanna find out um, where they are so you can know if it's easy to get to or not. Um, then the next thing is in terms of ranking is a lot of people get confused about the way that they should be ranking. Um, and it's you should be ranking the schemes in the order of what you actually want and not the order of what you think you will get. So a lot of people get confused about this because they might say to me, oh, I want London, but I don't think I did well enough on my SJT to rank London as my number one. So there's no point in me putting London as my number one. Um, but that's not how it works when they kind of uh, when they assign you to a scheme. The way it works is they go through the ranking. So who ranked number one in the country, who ranked number two, um, and they say, what was their number one choice? Is it available? If it is, let's give it to them. If it's not, what's their second choice? Is it available? If not, you know, we'll go, and they keep going down the order. So when you rank your schemes, uh, you should literally put it in the exact order that you want, because when it's your turn, let's say you rank 60th, and they've uh, you know, assigned all the other 59 students and you're the 60th, they'll say, okay, what is your number one choice? Is that scheme still available or is it full up? If it's available, you're gonna get it. Um, so you know, literally just rank what you want and not what you think you'll get. Um, literally, it doesn't matter how poorly you think you've done on your SJT. Um, all these things that I've mentioned, so a lot of things like uh, where are the study days, um, how is the actual scheme and things like that, um, you won't be able to find out easily. So that's where it's useful to speak to the previous FDs in that scheme. The best way I found to do that is on this Facebook page. Um, so Deciduous, um, um, there's about 3000 something members in there. And when we joined at the beginning of the year, uh, this guy Surab put up a post saying, if you guys uh, want to put down your schemes um, in the comments, then we can start to make group chats and things like that. So I'll put a link for this uh, for you guys in the comments. So all you, all you guys who are in fifth year, if you go to this link and go to the comments of this post, you've got 485 FDs who have commented which scheme they're on. And so you can literally just message them, whatever you like, um, ask them all the questions, you know, we're all nice, of course. And, you know, if you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer. Um, and if you're currently in, you know, fourth year or third year, then of course, try to look out for something like this um, in the years to come. Um, but I'll make sure I put a link for this. Uh, there's a lot of links I'm gonna give in this talk. Um, I'll make sure to put all of them in the um, group chat for you guys at the end. Um, another thing is, so in terms of ranking, there's about like 64 schemes. And um, I don't know about you guys, but like my geography is really bad. I don't know where certain areas are. Like, I don't know where Shropshire or Telford is, um, but there's a scheme for it. Um, and there's no actual map or no one's actually made a map where um, you can tell where all the schemes are in relationship to another. But this website that I found, again, I'll, 
I'll give you guys the link. Um, if you go on it, it's got all the different regions and the names that's on this map matches pretty much exactly to what's on the 64 list that you guys have to rank. Um, and it just gives you a nice idea of the location of where things are. So for me, when I was ranking it, I highlighted London in red and I literally just worked my way out um, and I, I did my ranking in that way. Um, and you can just color those kind of um, schemes in as you rank them. Um, I thought this was really useful. Um, and there's certain, um, you could make your own one on Google Maps, but that just takes a long time. Um, the next thing after that will be ranking practices. Um, now, uh, we were given the list of practices a few weeks after we were actually assigned to a scheme. Um, and we were only given a few days to rank them. Literally, I think it was just about three to four days to decide which practices we wanted to go to. So my advice would be, if you can start researching the practices before the list is actually given out. So of course, like I said, if you're on that Facebook page, you can find someone who's in that scheme and you can ask them, do you have your list of practices from last year? 90% of the time, they're gonna be the same. So look into the practices, go on their website, look at the Google Maps reviews, look at their location, look at, go to the area, drive around, see if it's something that you like. Um, and that way you can kind of have a much better idea of uh, the kind of practice you want to go to. Um, and the kind of questions you want, to, you want to be asking is kind of like, um, are you still in contact with the previous trainees? Um, if they are, that's really good because it shows that the kind of um, educational supervisor is willing to kind of act like a mentor for them, still stay in contact and still help them even after their foundation training. Um, are the patients high needs or low needs? Again, that would kind of indicate how much treatment are you gonna do? How many dentists are at the practice? Um, it's really useful when you have a lot of dentists at the practice because when your educational supervisors aren't there, then you have all these other associates and dentists that you can ask for for help. Um, whereas if there's just one or two dentists there, it can be difficult because they might be sick. And so there may be days where you're literally there at the practice on your own. Um, you wanna know if you're the only foundation dentist there. Some practices have two foundation dentists. Um, some people see that as a great thing. Some people see that as a bad thing. It depends on how you are. If you want 50-50 split attention, you might think it's a bad thing. If you think it'll be much nicer because you'll have someone um, that you can relate to and work with, that would be really nice as well. Um, of course, specialists at the practice are really nice. If you have an endodontist, an oral surgeon, um, you can learn a lot from shadowing them as well. Um, and whether you have multiple nurses that you work with or just a one set nurse, it's really nice if you have one set nurse because you guys can um, kind of figure out the way you work with each other and you could just work really efficiently. Um, the working hours of the educational supervisor is really important because some of them may not be in the practice all the time. Um, and so you really want to make sure you kind of pick a practice that has the educational supervisor there most of the time, because you want to be constantly calling them for help, getting as much from, um, from them as you can. Now, before you start your uh, foundation training, I would suggest you actually do some basic reading beforehand. Some schemes um, will make you shadow for a long time. So in London, we shadowed, um, um, you know, we had about a two week induction to the scheme and then another one or two weeks in practice shadowing before we were allowed to see patients. Um, but not all schemes are like that. In some schemes, I know my friends were in like Leicester or something like that. Um, literally on their first or second day, they were taking teeth out. So you could get thrown right there in the deep end. And so you kind of do want to do some basic reading up beforehand, um, just so you're, you don't go in completely unprepared. So starting the FD, um, I'm just going to give out literally just bullet point tips of what I think, you know, you guys should be thinking about for DFT. Um, at the beginning, I think it's really important to be honest with your educational supervisor. Um, and I know you might feel like you don't want them to think you're a bad dentist. You don't want to tell them all your weaknesses because you want to impress them. You want to, you know, uh, be as helpful as you can. Um, but just being honest with them, for example, just telling them, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have much experience with extractions or I don't have much experience with root canals. They can help you and they can, they're can they not going to be judgmental and they will set up tutorials and things like that. Um, and it just helps um, from the get-go, if you're honest with them, moving forward, um, you'll know exactly what bits you want to focus on with your learning. Um, another thing is shadow. And, and I did that for about two weeks um, when I was um, with Dr. Gore. Um, and it was honestly so useful. Um, I was able to shadow Dr. Gore, my other educational supervisors, um, the specialists at the practice and the associates. Um, and it's really good because you can see the way that they speak to patients, uh, the way they explain treatment options. Um, do they walk the patient out to reception or not? What materials do they use? What instruments do they use? Um, all these things can help you become um, so much um, 
uh, more comfortable when you first start seeing patients because you'll pick up on some of those sentences that they use um, and you'll become much more fluent when you're explaining treatment options, um, especially when you've got complex case with lots of caries, um, they've got lots of different options like bridges, crowns, things like that. When you listen to an associate or an experienced associate explain that to a patient, you'll see that they're able to explain it in a very short amount of time and the patient in a way that the patient can understand. And if you can replicate that, then you're already winning. Um, next thing is, as I mentioned, making a list of tutorials you want. So highlight your weaknesses with your educational supervisor, make a list of tutorials so you can literally just extract as much information from your educational supervisors as possible. They're very experienced, they know a lot. So, um, you know, use and abuse, literally just absorb all the knowledge that your educational supervisors have, because this is literally the only year that you'll have this kind of opportunity. Next thing is about making notes. So after you see patients for about one or two weeks, um, you'll have a pretty good idea of how you write your notes, what things you include and things like that. So I think a good, that's a good time for you to actually make your own templates. You can of course get some templates from your um, educational supervisors or the other associates at the practice, um, but you really have to make them your own. Um, and um, if, you, if you do certain things that they don't do, add it into your template, or if they do certain things that you don't do, just make sure you delete them. Um, and remember, make your templates as comprehensive as possible and include the information because typing and adding to your notes takes much longer than deleting. So for example, if you're putting caries risk, pre-fill it with high, medium, and low um, so that when you come to actually write the notes, you can just delete the ones that are irrelevant rather than having to type out high caries risk. Um, last one is ask your educational supervisor for as much help as you can. Um, I know you might think that, you know, a filling might be going perfectly or you feel uh, that you don't want to call them in too much because they think you're needy or things like that. Um, but from my experience, literally every single time I've called in my educational supervisor and I've been able to learn something. Um, every single time they're able to just, you pick up like little gems of, of uh, like tips um, and they all build up and add up. So even when I'm doing, uh, I'm having an appointment where everything seems to be going perfectly, my prep seems to be perfect, I don't have any concerns about it, I will still call the educational supervisor in and ask them to check it because they may be able to pick up on something that I wasn't able to be, to be able to pick out on. And as I said, this is literally the only year that you guys will have this opportunity. So just make most of it um, or make, make as much use of it as you can. And for the times that you can't call them in, you know, of course we have AGPs and things like that, then I think that's where the next tip is. And that's about um, using the practice camera. Um, all foundation practices are required to have a camera. Um, it's part of their rules. There can't be a foundation uh, practice without one. So make sure you use it as much as you can because um, on the times that your supervisor can't come in, if you take photos and then show it to them after, you're able to get feedback from them. Um, and I recently started doing this um, because it's been quite difficult with AGPs to get my supervisor in. Um, and it's been really helpful. They're able, my Dr. Gore is able to give me advice um, on the treatment, even when she's not there. And when you start analyzing your own work with photos after, you start to notice so many things. Like for example, in this one, I did an amalgam prep. In the appointment, I didn't really realize just how much damage I did to the adjacent amalgam. And it was only after I looked at the photo um, after the treatment that I realized like I really roughened up that amalgam and so now that's a learning point for me and now I know next time I do it maybe I might want to wedge the tooth or put a matrix band in but if I hadn't taken that photo I wouldn't have learned this point so just literally take as many photos as you can um, get used to the camera and its settings um, and at the beginning if you can ask your um, educational supervisor for a tutorial on photography just so you know where um, how to use it and things like that um Surviving DFT. So there's a lot of things in DFT. I know you, you guys might think it's going to be really like overwhelming and, and it's true. You're working a nine to five job. You're seeing a lot of patients, um, but there's a lot of things that you can do to kind of um, make it easier for yourself. Um, when, if I was to ask all my other foundation trainees, what do you struggle with most for DFT? The first thing they're going to say is e-portfolio. Um, and this is the system that we have where we have to kind of write reflections on our tutorials, our study days, our general, um, like how our experience has been so far, our audits and things like that. Um, and it's just a lot of admin. And the reason it stresses us out is because there's no um, kind of way to keep on top of it properly because they don't notify you. There's no kind of list of what to do. Um, and my advice would be, um, watch my YouTube video. I'm self-plugging, but I've made a template and it's just got everything that you need in terms of 
the list of things that you need to tick off. Um, I know it's really early for you guys, so save it and you can watch it later, but having a template that you can use um, just really saves a lot of time for you um, when you're writing your reflections on your study days and things like that. So e-portfolio will be probably the thing that you'll hate the most. You've got to do it. So my advice is talk to as many foundation dentists as you can, get advice from them on how to maintain it and keep up to date with it, because when it builds up, it can become really stressful. Um, the next thing that kind of stresses people out, I guess, is UDAs. Um, we have targets, and of course, COVID makes things a lot more dif uh, difficult. Um, but truthfully, you know, I'm a bit low on my UDAs at the moment, um, but I'm not worried. Um, and that's because I think at the beginning, it's really important to focus on actually doing good dentistry. Take your time with your appointments so you can actually learn, make your cavity preps as nice as possible. Um, and then further down the line, maybe eight months in, six months in, then you can think about shortening your appointment times, try to really get those UDAs in. Um, don't stress about them at the beginning. Um, you'll, you'll, hit them you'll hit the targets by the end, most likely, and especially by next year, hopefully it'll be much better for you guys. Um, next thing is about mistakes. Now, I think as DFTs, we're, all, we're of course bound to make mistakes. We're bound to have uh, perforations, pulp exposures, and things like that. And it really used to bother me at the beginning. Um, and I think my advice here is kind of, of course, it's easy to say for me to say, don't dwell on it. But um, someone told me this and it really stuck with me was that at the end of the day, the, and again, this is not an excuse for you making mistakes and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's not your fault that the patient has caries that's close to the pulp. It's not your fault that the patient hasn't been taking care of the teeth. You know, they're there in the chair. You're doing your best to take care of their teeth. Um, and as long as you mention the risks such as perforations or pulp exposures to your patient, um, it's not your fault if it happens. If the caries was close to the pulp, it was close to the pulp and it was going to get exposed. Um, and this is why I think it's, it's a learning experience for us all. And, um, you know, if, you, if it does happen to you, don't worry about it. Um, you know, if you perforate, that's the thing. You're a GDP, you're a dental foundation trainee. You're not a specialist. The patient should, will have known before if they want the best survival for that tooth, they could have gone to a specialist. Um, and again, I'm not trying to say this as an excuse for bad dentistry or to say like literally go do whatever you want and it won't matter. Um, but it's kind of to make, make yourself feel better once these mistakes happen because they're bound to happen. Um, and at the end of the day, it's really not your fault. Um, and the last thing I, I want to say about kind of the stress of DFT is like separating your normal life from your dental life. I think um, from my experience, especially because I'm doing foundation training and I'm running the YouTube channel, I found dentistry was kind of, over the last few months, it was just completely taken over my life. Um, and it can become draining if you let it. Um, because there's so many things that you have to do, like seeing the patients and then the e-portfolio. And I got to a point where, because I was doing the YouTube thing as well, um, I was constantly thinking about dentistry, like when I was in the shower, on, on my way to work, on my way back from work. Um, and it gets really draining. And, you know, they say dentists have the highest suicide rate. And it's because if you don't control it um, and you don't separate your dental life from your normal life, um, it can really take over your, your, your mind. You'll constantly be stressing about these things. Um, and, you know, some of the ways I've been able to do that is, for example, on Fridays and Saturdays, I don't do anything related to dentistry. Um, you know, I, I don't work on the YouTube channel. I don't do my e-portfolio. So Fridays and Saturdays are my off days. Um, and I, and I, I would advise you guys to take as much off time as you can and uh, just literally separate dentistry from your normal life. Um, another way I do it is on my personal um, Instagram, for example, I don't follow any dental accounts. Um, I leave that for my two dentist accounts. So when I'm on my personal Instagram, I think that's my downtime. I want to be looking at memes or like laughing or enjoying things, looking at music videos or whatever. Um, I don't want to be seeing lots of dentistry because that's, you know, for when I'm on dentistry mode. Um, so kind of, I think if you don't have a second Instagram account, just make up a fake one and follow your dental accounts on that. Don't um, populate your life completely with dentistry. Um, and uh, another reason I have this photo here, it's not my photo, I wish, um, but it's, I think, about unrealistic um, expectations from Instagram. I think there's so much, um, you know, amazing anterior composites, posterior composites, and, you know, this amazing rubber dam um, on Instagram. And we tend to see that sometimes. We think, oh, this is, you know, this looks really good. Let me go and try and replicate it. And then you go and try and you try and do a nice posterior composite and yours just doesn't come out like that. And then you start to feel bad. Um, so I think trying to kind of um, set the standards from Instagram is just really bad. And people only post the good stuff on Instagram. I've rarely seen any accounts posting their failures or their bad stuff. Whilst I do think Instagram is a great, like, you know, place to learn things. And I've learned so much from it. Don't set your standards from Instagram and don't expect your stuff to look like the stuff that's on Instagram as well.
but let's move on. I got a bit uh, deep there. <laughs> um, but let's talk about some of the better stuff from DFC, which is the money. So you guys will get paid, um, I think it's about 2,200 a month after tax. Um, like you have your national insurance and your student finance and things like that. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of ways that you can spend that money, especially if you're living at home, you're not really going to have many expenses. So right now I'm living at home. I don't pay rent. I don't pay bills. I don't you know, really pay for food. The only kind of bills I have is just like my Spotify, my gym membership, or, which is kind of canceled now anyways. But um, so all this money that comes in, I have to decide what I want to do with it. Um, and I think one of the best things for you guys to do in your foundation training is to invest it in yourself and invest it in your career. So the first thing, the first way to do that, of course, is if you get your own camera. Um, this is not a necessity. Of course, your practice will have a camera. And if you are comfortable with using that, go ahead. The only reason I would personally advise getting your own camera is that if you have your own camera by your side, every single appointment and it's yours, it's a really great motivator for you to take more photos. Um, but I completely appreciate that it can be expensive. Um, but if you are saving up over a few months, then it can be re uh, quite reasonable. Um, and I think, you know, we should all know, you know, the current FD years, the FD plus ones, they're going to call us next year. Everyone knows we're probably going to be some of the worst FD ones that are to come out of Foundation Dentists because we haven't had as much experience as the previous FDs. One thing that can help you get that associate job will be if you have a portfolio. And that's where I think it's so important if you can practice with the camera, take as many pictures as you can and build up your portfolio for that associate job. And if you are able to prove to the practice owner that, look, these are the kind of restorations I can do. This is how I do my rubber dam. Then it can really help with uh, getting that associate job. Um, the next thing um, you can invest in yourself is loops. This is controversial. A lot of people say you should wait a few years. Um, some people say, you know, um, get them as early as possible. I'm quite opinionated on this topic. I'm on the team of get them as soon as you can, as soon as you can afford them. If that's in dental school, great. Get it in dental school. You get the student discount. If not, then, you know, of course, wait till FD um, when you have some more money. Um, for me, it, I think it's kind of um, a, a, a deal breaker. Not deal breaker, sorry. It's a massive thing to be able to see so much more with the loops and the light is just magnificent. Um, I feel like I just do so much better dentistry. And I think you do the most, you get the most learning out of fourth year, fifth year, FD year and your associate year. That's where you get, you learn so much. I would rather learn with loops with then compared to without loops. Um, but saying that, please like make sure you do your research before you buy them. Um, don't just literally buy from the first company that comes, comes to your uni or your practice because um, there's a lot of different variations. Um, if you guys want advice, you can always message me um, and um, I can give you any advice on that. Um, the next thing is courses. And I've got a line ag across it because I think you know, we come out of dental school really motivated and we're like, I want to do this course and that course. But I do think it's too early um, because you just won't have the opportunity to apply the knowledge. There's no point in you doing a, mass, a, a really nice Monique Vassant anterior composite course if you can't go back into practice and do some anterior composites. Um, whereas if you kind of wait for your FDA after when you're an associate um, and you have a lot more experience, you can go to that course um, with some difficult cases that you've done. Um, you know, you, you do some anterior composites record them, and then go to that course and ask the people there for advice. Like, look, I had this case, how can I improve? Because you don't want to go to a course and learn the basics. You should already have the basic knowledge. And when you go to the course, you're literally learning that top 5% elite advice that they're gonna give that's just gonna take that skill to the next level. And you can't really do that if you're just a foundation dentist. You have to get some experience and then do the courses. You'll, you'll gain a lot more from that course. Um, Next thing about finances is about kind of like planning them. Of course, big disclaimer, like I'm not a financial advisor. Obviously, this is just what I've learned by just doing research online. I've talked to people. So if you decide to listen to any of my advice and you lose money, don't sue me, please. Um, I think as a DFT, you're going to have, a, as I said, you'll have a lot of uh, spare money. Um, if you're living at home, you pretty much have about um, 1,500 pounds extra money each month. And, you know, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and a great way to kind of plan them is um, this website um, called, let me get it up, it's ukpersonal.finance. Um, they have a really nice flow chart that kind of takes you through the order of um, what you should be prioritizing in terms of um, how you spend your money. So when you get a big lump sum of money that comes into your account, you need to decide what am I going to do with it? What's going to pay my bills and which part of it can I save and um, which part of it do I need to invest? So 
I've summarized it very briefly here. You guys can go on the link and in your spare time, read up on a lot more of this, especially um, after you graduate in your summer, um, when you have more time, really look into your finances and get on top of it from early on. Um, you'll be much better off in the long run. But to summarize it, you want to put all your money aside for your expenses. That would be your uh, essential bills, your rent, your council tax, your food, your Spotify, whatever that is. Um, then you want to make sure you're enrolled in a pension that's already done for you because you've got the NHS pension, which is great. Um, then you want to pay off any high interest credit that you have. So if you have credit cards, um, pay them off as soon as you can. Um, this doesn't include student finance. Student finance is a bit of a different game because it's not like normal credit. Um, student finance is debatable whether you pay it off early or not, um, but that's a whole different topic. Um, then you want to build your emergency fund. Um, you can see from COVID, so many dentists lost their jobs and they literally had no income uh, for some months. Of course, as a DFD, you're salaried, so you're a bit more protected. So maybe your emergency fund won't need to be as big, um, but it's still good to have an emergency fund of about three to six months. Um, just so you know, if something happens, you're not going to get paid, um, then you can at least um, have something to fall back on. And then the saving kind of goes into two, two categories. It's short-term goals and long-term goals. Uh, your short-term short goals might be, um, you know, I, wa I want to um, buy uh, a camera within the next few years, or I want to do buy this in the next few years. Long-term goals might be, I want to own a practice in 10, 15 years, something that will cost a lot more. Um, and the different ways of doing that is with um, ISAs. ISAs are individual savings accounts, um, which you can, the government is allowing you to invest up to uh, 20,000 pounds every year tax-free. So you're basically allowing your money to grow and make more money for you whilst you do nothing and you don't have to pay any tax on it. Um, there's different types of ISAs. Um, I'm briefly going to go through them today. So the stocks and shares ISA is the one you should be using mainly for your long-term goals. Um, you can either purchase like individual stocks. So that might be you buying a stock in Apple or Facebook or Tesla, um, or you can buy a collection of stocks and that's an ETF like the S&P 500. That's a collection of the 500 biggest companies in the world, in, in, in America. Um, and that way you're kind of diversifying your portfolio. Um, and you can use that to um, put money aside for your long-term goals. And that's long-term because of course, stocks and shares always have the ups and downs, but over the long-term, which is five plus years, they always go up and they usually yield about a 7% return. Um, so, you know, if you're putting your money in their long run, in the long run, you will at least get 7% um, interest on it every single year. Um, cash ISAs, um, they're just literally like a bank account. So it's like a typical savings account. Um, and they have different rates that vary between 0.5 or 1.1 at the moment because of Corona, it's all gone down. So you might find it hard to get higher rates, but you should use that for short term goals. And that's because, um, as I said, stocks and shares can go up and down and you don't want to be taking your money out when the stock or your, your stock and shares ISA has taken a hit. Um, so you want it in something stable and cash ISAs are guaranteed stable um, income and you can have that for your short term goals. Um, the lifetime ISA, you can contribute £4,000 into it um, and the government will add 25% to it every single year. So if you add £4,000 into it, the government will top it up by £1,000 and you can do this um, um, from the age of 18 and you can use it to buy your first home. Um, and this is amazing for, you know, first time home, home buyers. Um, if you contribute to this every single year, um, you're basically getting 25% um, um, return on your, on, on your money um, without any kind of complications. Um, and they're really good. Um, it's a lot of stuff and I know it can be kind of complicated, um, but there are, there's loads of places you can get information from and you can do this as early as possible. You don't have to wait till you've graduated or anything. There are face so this Facebook group, I'll put a link in as well. Lots of dentists that who give advice. And if you read their questions, you can, they'll be very happy to answer um, any questions you guys have. Um, and YouTube, I think pretty much nearly everything I know about uh, all of this, um, all of like technology and YouTube and things that I, I've learned everything from YouTube. If you search it up, there's so much information out there. Um, a lot of information about ISAs, a lot of information about investments um, and things like that. So really do take your time, um, look into it a little bit um, and um, you can um, um, invest your money and make your money uh, work for you. Um, the last thing I wanted to kind of mention briefly was just about credit score. And again, I know it's a lot of finance stuff, but I think this is something that's not really covered much. I think you guys will have heard all the generic advice and things like that, but um, these are the things that will literally set you up for the rest of your life. Um, so building your credit score, I'm going to just briefly cover it. 
apply for a credit card as soon as you can. Once you become a dentist, you'll have, you, 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 you'll have good income. So when you apply, you're most likely going to get accepted for a credit card. Um, make sure you're registered on the electoral roll. Um, when you have your credit cards, always make sure you're spending less than 25% of it. Set up a direct debit and pay it in full every single month. Um, and if they allow you to have a um, credit card limit increase, um, accept it. You want to have the biggest limit that you can um, so that you can spend more money on your credit card, but not hit the 25% um, limit. So I think that was all I had to say about kind of DFT. I hope you guys found that useful. I will put all the links that I mentioned. Um, and I think um, you guys have so much to look forward to. I think it's such a great year. You have so much to learn. You meet so many like, great people, the teams, you know, that you work with your own nurse. Um, the patients are lovely. Um, you know, at Bristol, um, that's where I went. Um, you know, a lot of the peds patients, the, the kids, like they were all screaming, they were really scared, but in practice, the kids are really nice. Um, and you get to enjoy a lot of it. Um, and patients are genuinely really thankful. Most of the time, um, you know, of course, especially during the pandemic, you know, when they're coming in pain and you're kind of helping them, um, patients are very thankful. And it does make the job very satisfying when, um, you know, you put a smile on these people's faces and get them out of pain. So if you guys want to message me, um, you can message me on Instagram. Um, I'll literally answer any questions you guys have. Um, and that's it. Um, don't know if you had any questions. Um, from the chat i'll be happy thank to answer you. them thank you so much puya that was amazing really well presented very informative you. you covered almost everything mm -hmm. and i'm sure everybody agrees that it was amazing and very useful um i believe there's some questions in the chat mm -hmm. um do you want me to read them out or can you ask uh, i think i can them? see it so yeah I had one question uh, do you recommend the tipton training course by Pro, uh, prof tipton um, I haven't been on the course, um, so I can't really say what I think about it. I've spoken to one person who's been on the course and they said it was great. Um, I think there are loads of courses out there. There's, uh, there's Tipton, there's Monica Sant, um, there's Aspire. Um, and the, I can't tell you how, which ones are good because I haven't done any of them. Your best person to ask will be people who have done those courses. Um, and for you to find out what you want to kind of learn um, in the future. So I think as a foundation dentist, it's quite hard uh, to decide what you want to go into specifically. I think courses that are quite wide, so like a general aesthetic and restorative course is quite good because they cover, you know, crown preps, they cover a little bit of endo, they cover a little bit of pros, so you can kind of learn a bit about them. Um, but the best person to ask would probably be um, someone who's done the course. Um, and if you guys are looking into it, you can message me. I'll let you guys know if I know anyone, because I've been looking into it myself as yeah. well. Um, Puya is very right. Um, it's very difficult. You know, uh, these uh, these courses are so personal, some of them. Uh, but you need to know what, uh, what um, type of pathway you're taking in dentistry. Mm -hmm. Are you going to take an academic pathway um, or are you there just to do a few courses to upskill yourself so yeah. after your foundation training you actually learn to know what your weaknesses and strengths are okay. and based upon that you can decide what you want to do say for instance if your endo skills are not great maybe mm -hmm. you want to choose to go on an endo course or if your yeah. composites are not turning up nice maybe you'd like to do a two-day um, endo course but um, if you decide to go through an ac academic route mm -hmm. then you could always choose a PG cert route mm -hmm. uh, where it's a postgraduate diploma restorative or endo or ortho or whichever you would like mm -hmm. and then you can then work yourself towards diploma and then eventually master's so uh, this is something you could also discuss with your educational supervisors Definitely. eventually towards the end of your DFT year Mm -hmm. And also, as uh, Puya correctly said, you could discuss it with people who've actually done the course. But um, um, I'm a very academic and I just feel the PG cert way building up towards diploma and um, uh, master's. It, it is a good route um, mm -hmm. because you, you network, um, you, will be, uh, you will be with a group of people who are like minded. You learn to network as well as, um, you know, you will be covering all aspects of dentistry, say, for instance, restorative, if you do, if you mm -hmm. do stick to ortho, then it's different, then you can end up becoming an orthodontist. So, um, so um, yeah, I think after DFT um, route is something that you could then mm -hmm. um, sort of, you know, look into further. Yeah. Um, if there was another question. Um, mm -hmm. So by joining NHS pension, dentists are unable to incorporate. Would this be a loss in terms of taxation since corporate tax is only 19%? Um, I think, um, so as a, um, a foundation dentist, you're going to be automatically enrolled onto the NHS pension. 
and it's a guaranteed pension and that's uh, probably one of the best you're going to get at the moment by the time you've become an associate and you're at the stage where you're thinking about um, you know registering as a as a company and becoming a corporation then that's the time you need to speak to an independent financial advisor um, to kind of give you the advice they'll be able to calculate whether it is a good idea for you to incorporate or not basically um, and because it depends on so many things um, and independent financial advisors are um, not too hard to find that um, Facebook group chat that I put um, the Facebook the dentists who invest there are quite a few independent financial advisors in there that you could ask about um, and they'll be able to advise you guys on whether it's a good idea to incorporate or not but in during your DFT year the NHS pension is a guaranteed pension so just keep it that's my opinion again not a financial advisor <laughs> um, um, and then after that, then you can decide um, if you would like to open up your own pension, your um, SIPP or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Puya. Um, I'm sure everyone agrees it was amazing. You did really well. Um, we'll give you a big thank clap you. and I'm sure we'll, we'll do that at the end as well. Thank you, um, everyone.